All right, Spirit Life. Here we go, Spirit Life. We've been learning a lot. I think we've uh, covered some great ground so far on the gifts, but we're just really getting started on that area. Um, it's going to be really, really in-depth as we move along because there's so much to teach in the gifts, so it's not one, two, three, we're out of here. This is going to be a little camp out, so go ahead and get your lantern, your igloo, your, your little... Uh, your, your little uh, sleeping bag, and well, don't go to sleep on me, but you know what I mean. Let's get let's get this done. All right, so we're going to go back to First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse one. Let's just stroll down a little bit of recap, not too much. Uh, now about the spirit, spiritual gifts, the special endowments given by the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. I don't want you to be ignorant or uninformed. Uh, he, King James says what? Ignorant, right? Uh, he, he doesn't want us to be uninformed. Again, there's so many people that are uninformed about the spiritual gifts, and that's a shame, and that's, that's the problem of a pastor. That's not God's problem. God didn't do that. Our pastors don't do it because they don't want to talk about it. One of the things pastors don't want to do, most pastors, they don't want to lose control. And what I mean by that is they don't even want God to take over. They don't want God to take over, so they have it all formatted how they're going to do it, and then that's the way it's going to be, and God's not allowed to move in that box. How many of y'all have been in a church like that? You, in, in, you, I'm talking about spirit-filled, too. I'm talking about charismatic, you know, whatever, uh, I call them Baptocostals. A Baptocostal type of church is where they believe in the Spirit of God moving, but then they'll, they'll, they won't yield to the Holy Ghost, but they'll tell the Holy Ghost to yield, Okay. He doesn't want us to be an uninformed, okay? So we've got to learn. You know that when you were pagans, how many of y'all used to be a pagan? You were led off after speechless idols. However, you were led off whether by impulse or by habit. But notice this, the pagans, he, he talks about being uninformed and ignorant with pagan idols. In other words, if you have a relation, if you say, you're a Christian, if you say that you, you know God, you don't know his spirit, then you're no different than someone who worships an idol. Wow, that was pretty rough, wasn't it? But, it? but in sense it is because you're not worshiping the Godhead and the totality of who God is. You're just worshiping him as a father or a creator and not worshiping him in the totality of what he is, who he is, what he can do, and the attributes of him. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Three and one, it's a mystery that I don't understand. Okay? I don't know. I don't have a grasp on that. I just believe it. I don't know how that sun stays up in the sky all day. And I'm moving. It's not. Is that right? That thing stays there, don't it? But I'm the guy moving. Actually, I'm spinning. A thousand miles an hour spinning, but yet I don't feel it. And I, yeah, okay, so there you go. Just that one little brain thing gives you, you know, a, a, a skid mark in your head. You're like, what? All right, so do you see that comparison there? He, that's the comparison of why would he say that? He's comparing it, okay? He is. Next verse. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking about the power of the influence of the Spirit of God can say, Jesus be a curse, which was something really, really used back in that day to get to, to, to speak against Christ. Anathema, I believe, is a word. And no one can say, Jesus is my Lord, except by the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. So notice that, by the power of what? The Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that helps us say that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because we know it by revelation. All right, this is all extra. Next now, there are div uh, distinctive varieties or yeah, v varieties of spiritual gifts, special abilities given by the grace and extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit operating in believers, but it's the same Spirit. So let's look at that. It's different, right? Different gifts, but the same Spirit. Next verse. We're going to move along. And there are distinctive varieties of ministries and service, but it's what? The same Lord. Verse 6, there are distinctive ways of working to accomplish what? But it's the same God, 
who produces all things and all believers. Verse 7, because we're going to get to 8 and move on. But to each one is given the manifestation. But to each one, each one, is that you? That's me. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, the spiritual illumination and the enabling of the Holy Spirit for what? The common good. So you and I are anointed for the common good. You and I are anointed for the body of Christ. You and I are anointed for the kingdom of God. You and I are not anointed to be illuminating so everybody could look at us and say, man, that's a spiritual guy right there. What a spiritual cat. What a spiritual dude or dudette, right? It is not. It is for the common good. And that's where we have a problem in the church today is because we have Christian idolatry that God anoints somebody, illuminates somebody, they have an oppressive ministry, whatever it may be. It could be oratorical, they, they could be singers, they could be great preachers, teachers. It doesn't matter. And then we take that and we illuminate them and say, you know, oh, they're, they're so special. Well, they may be special in God's service, but their humility should be for the common good of us all. They should be willing to serve all people. You should be able to touch them. This is why I always say that statement about Dr. Summerall, that true shepherds smell like sheep. They smell like sheep. Um, you can say what you want to say about the whole Olstein thing, but John Olstein, his dad, was a whole different person. And there was one thing about jo John Olstein that uh, when he was pastoring, when he was alive, I believe it was 30,000 members, he still went to the back of the church to shake hands with everybody. That, that was his methodology. He still felt like he was a pastor. And there were stories that he would literally cry on the way to church. And his wife would say, what is wrong with you? He says, I'm afraid they're not going to come. She says, what are you talking about? There, there's 30,000 members. He said, no, come to the cross, come to the altar. He was a man of great salvation. I don't know what happened, but you know what I mean? <laughs> with family. But that's a powerful story, isn't it? And it was good for the common, common good. It was for everybody. All right, here's where we go. Verse 8, this is, uh, what are we, 25 now? Yeah, part 25, check this out. There we go. To one is given through the Holy Spirit the power to speak the message of wisdom, and to another the power to express the word of knowledge and the understanding according to the same Spirit. Let's go to the next verse, and then I'll bring it together. And to another, wonder-working faith by the same Holy Spirit, and to another, the extraordinary gifts of healing by one Spirit. So I'm going to stop right there. So we kind of touched on this before. I was going to give you the 10 ministry gifts of the, or the ministries of the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to wait on that because it actually takes us out of context of where I've, I started you. So remind me to go back to that, okay? But in here, we're now we're talking about the gifts of revelation, the gifts of revelation or revelatory gifts. These are very powerful gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to everybody as he desires, not everybody will operate in this, but everybody can. Please understand this about the gifts. The problem that we have in humanity is we look at things from a specialty point of view. Well, that guy is specially trained to be a brain surgeon. I can never be this. I can never do it. Well, that person is specially trained to do this. I can never do this. I can never do that. That's how we look at life. And in some cases, that's very true. I cannot perform brain surgery. Don't ask me <laughs> to perform brain surgery. I'm the wrong guy. But somebody like Ben Carlson uh, and others, they, they could do it. I think he's one of the leading uh, neurologists or what have you. Pick another name if you don't like him politically. I'm just saying there are people that have skills. This is not that. You, you don't earn this. You don't train for this as opposed to as, as going to school and studying it. You can learn it as you're doing it today, but it is the Holy Spirit that does it. You can hone it and sharpen your gifts, which we're going to talk about later. But as far as it being something that you just go like, like that, you know, no, you don't do that. You don't squeeze it like you squeeze faith or something. You, don't, you know, people say, I'm going to get some more faith. It doesn't work that way. It works by the Holy Spirit saying, I'm going to use you in this area. It works, too, by you saying, Lord, I'm open to any of the gifts you want to use me in. 
When's the last time anybody, those watching, by the way, global live stream, we love you, family. We love our church. How many of you all have, have done that? Just said, Lord, use me in the gifts. Not just use me, send me to the nation, but Lord, use me in the gifts. Today, I ask for you to use me. As I go to Walmart, Lord, let a revelatory gift be upon my heart. Not a lot of us do that. Not a lot of us do that. Not a lot of us ask. Again, sometimes it's because we we're ignorant, we're not taught, we're misinformed. And then other things is because we're mistaught, untaught, we're taught wrong, and we don't believe it belongs to us. It belongs to the guy with the shiny shoes and the slick hair and the microphone and the one with the hair. That's not true. That is not true. It is for you. So you got to get that in your heart. So write that in your notes somewhere. These gifts are for me. They're called gifts. They're gifts. They're special endowments by God giving them to you. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, gave gifts unto men. And we're going to talk about that later, about the prophet and the, the teacher and all that stuff, the fivefold ministry. But there was also the giftings that were clustered with the callings. Okay? You're all called. Okay, I didn't get no amens on that. But you're all called. Every single one of you are called to the ministry. It's just a different type of ministry. Okay? So it's the gift of revelation. So let's talk about the first one, which would be the word of wisdom. We started to talk about that a little bit, but we're going to get into some real, real in-depth teaching of it, okay? The word of wisdom. This is not folklore. This isn't take two spoons of apple cider vinegar with onion juice, and you'll never have constipated again, I'm telling you. It's not that. People say, boy, he has a lot of wisdom. That's not what this is, okay? It's divine, watch this, it's divine wisdom or to, the, to know the insight of the divine will and purpose of God to solve any problem, okay? Now, with apple cider and all that, I guess it'll do something for you, but that's not in context of what this is. This is the supernatural gift. You don't know this. This is beyond your human knowledge. This this right here passes your brain, passes your teaching. You can be as dumb as a box of rocks. Pardon me. You don't have to know something about a subject. And God can download through your spirit something divine, something that has the answer to a problem nobody else has an answer to. Do you know that? You could you can have inventions. You there's there's just so many things, medicines, uh, whatever. God can do anything with the word of wisdom, but mainly the word of wisdoms are used for redemption and to express that God is alive. Jesus died on the cross and He rose and He gave gifts. It's proof of the resurrection. Okay, let's look at a couple of scriptures to prove it because you got to have scripture. It's nice to sit here and talk about it. Let's show scripture. Right? Go to 1 Kings chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 16. Okay, I'm going to take you all over. So if you're, if you're wanting a quick shotgun teaching, you're in the wrong place tonight. But if you want to write down scripture and study, you're in the right place because that's where I'm headed. Like I said, we're camping out, so warm up next to the fire. 1 Kings 3. Yeah. Uh, I say 16, didn't I? Somewhere in there. Okay, the two women were prostitutes, came to the king and stood before him. Some of you all remember the story. And the one woman said, oh, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave, that's a bad problem right there anyways, and I gave, whew, I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. And on the third day after I gave birth, the woman also gave birth, and we were alone together, and no one else was with us in the house, just we two. Now this woman's son died during the night because she lay on him and smothered him. Southern, yeah, this happened before, hasn't it? So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from the place, his place besides me, while your maidservant was asleep and laid him on her bosom and laid her dead son on my bosom. Wow, that's pretty raw, isn't it? When I got up in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. But when I examined him carefully in the morning, behold, it was not my son, the one whom I had born. 
Then the other woman said, No, for my son is the one who's living, and your son is the dead one. But the first woman said, No, your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Now, this is a problem, isn't it? This is two stories, two people, no camera, no witnesses, standing before a king. This is how they were speaking before the king. This is bad. Then the king said, this woman says that this is my son, the one who is alive, and your son is the dead one. And the other woman says, no, for the son is the dead one, and my son is the one who is alive. Wow. Yeah, you ever been involved in a woman fight? Cat fight? Next verse. Then the king said, bring me a sword. Wow. Wow. Nice, nice king, huh? King chop him up. And so they brought a sword before the king. I could imagine, I could hear him going, go. Next verse. Then the king said, cut the living child in two and give half to the one woman and half to the other. I don't know if he talked that way, but sounds good. Next verse. Then the woman whose child was a living one spoke to the king, for she was deeply moved of her son, Oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, Ah, kill him. <laughs> he shall be neither mine nor yours. Cut him. Wow. Thanks, Mom. Then the king said, Give me the first woman who is pleading for his life, the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. What, what happened here? The king had what? Divine wisdom. He was given a revelatory gift as to what the true issue, the true problem, the true solution was, right? He didn't know it. He didn't have any other witnesses. He just went by discernment and by that word of wisdom, didn't he? Next verse. And when all the people of Israel heard about the judgment or the decision, okay? When you see judgment, it's not always killing bad. It means the right decision, which the king had made, they were in awe and reverently feared the king. Now, when you and I read this, because we read it in modern times, like, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. To them, it was like, what? Wow, what wisdom. Yeah, we can settle this right now. Bring the sword. We'll find out who really's heart is right. Isn't that something? For they saw that the wisdom of God, everybody circle that. I wish I had my little clicker. The wisdom of God was within him to administer justice. Wow. Wow. So not only did it highlight the king, obviously the king's like, well, yeah, I knew all along, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but he was a godly king. At least he said, you know, it's the Lord God of Israel, right? Some of y'all would have been like, well, come on, really? Been doing this a long time, right? That's so funny. Go to Matthew chapter 2. Chapter 2. So that's a great story, isn't it? Now, this is Old Testament. As you're going to Matthew chapter 2, let me explain something to you. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not in man. He did not reside in man. He resided on man. He had not entered into man because there was no salvation as in the blood of Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. They were anointed. You can read all kinds of stories where it says what? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, rested on his mantle. But it was never internal as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was a prophesied promise later in the book of Acts. Isaiah talked about it with stammering lips. They will speak with new tongues, these type of things. It was promised and prophesied, but it wasn't an actuality during their time. So he was operating with a mantle that came on him, but we can teach and see it is a revelatory gift. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so watch this. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Herod the great, Magi, or wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem asking, boy, we need those wise men to go to Washington. Wow, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. 
When Herod the king heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. Okay, so let me make sure I take you to verse 20. Let me take you to verse 20, because you know the rest of the story. They're, they're looking for him, right? I don't want to belabor it, so I'll take you to 20. Sorry about that, Joshua. I double clutched you. Yeah, verse 20. Yeah, Matthew 12, 2, verse 20. <clears throat> I'm trying to skip through the whole story. Uh, no, go on back. Go back. Uh, go to 15. No, go to 10. Let's stop right there. That's good enough. Yeah, I want, I, but I didn't want to go through the whole story. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. All right, now we're moving along. Next verse. Sorry about that. And after entering the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then all after opening their treasure gifts, they presented to him what? Gifts for a king. For a king. I don't have time for this, but I'm going to tell you something. You know, Jesus started out with, with a blessing. He, he was blessed, okay? These are gifts that you give to a king of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There, there's so much to this. And having been warned by God in a dream not to go back to Herod, do you see this? Here's where I wanted you to go. Having been warned by God in a dream. Now, a, a, a word of wisdom, the revelatory gift, a word of wisdom can be given through a dream. It's not all just standing there and all of a sudden you, you have a word like the king did or an ideal or a thought process. You can literally be sleeping and the Holy Spirit give you a dream as to an answer. Have you ever done that where you went to bed with a problem? You did not know what to do? My, my wife and I have this policy we've had for nearly 28 years that we never make decisions late at night or at night that are very pressing and important to us. Because we always find ourselves in confusion. We always find ourselves in this pressure to make a decision. We don't do that. If I can't sleep on something, now unless it's an emergency and you have to make a decision, that's different. But if we're going to make, I don't care, if a purchase or something, we're like, wait a minute, we'll call you in the morning. I push things off, even for the church. I'll, I'll let you know. And if they pressure me, I already know I'm not doing it. Don't push me because I'm like, eh, uh -uh, that's not how it works. You let me think about it and pray about it. But anyways, you've done that before, but you don't realize that's a word of wisdom given to you while you're sleeping, and all of a sudden that answer comes, and you wake up and you have the answer. You think you're that smart? Not necessarily. Now, you might be able to figure out some things, you know, how to open the top of a bottle. <laughs> but this is, you know, deep things that you don't understand. That's the Holy Spirit helping you. So understand that. So when you guys go to bed at night, everybody watching, listening, you got a major problem in your life, pray and say, God, show me the wisdom. Show me your divine will and your purpose. I don't know how to do this. This is impossible. The Red Sea is before me. The charging army of Pharaoh is behind me. What do I do? Goliath is on a big hill. What do I do? And then watch. You may not get it day one. It may take day two. It may take day 30. I don't know. But if you'll just wait upon the Lord, he will speak to you. And if he speaks to you through that nighttime thing, that's a word of wisdom, okay? So please don't think it's, it's always got to be somebody's eyes rolling back in their head and the Lord says, you know, uh, no. It, it can be very simple as you wake up in the morning, you go to the mirror, and all of a sudden you hear in your heart, do this or don't buy, or whatever. Okay. So I've been warned by a, uh, God in a dream to go back to Herod. The Magi left for their own country by another way. Next verse. If God would not have warned them, the story would be different, wouldn't it? And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Now watch this. To Joseph in a what? Dream. Same thing. Two stories mixed into one, two incidents mixed into one of words of wisdom, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and reign there until, you, uh, until I tell you, for Herod intends to search for the child in order to destroy him. Wow, that's a great intel. That's great information, isn't it? He gave him detail. Get out of here. Don't do anything until I come back and tell you. Right? That is a word of wisdom. 
Go to Luke chapter 22, verse 10. Luke 22, verse 10. I told you we're going to be all over, okay? Is that all right? And he replied, When you have entered a city, a man carrying an earthen jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Now, now go to verse 9, and let's bring this into context. And they asked him, Where do you want us to prepare it? Next verse, back to 10. He was talking about getting ready for the Passover, right? Now watch this. He replied, When you have entered the city, a man carrying an earthen jar of water will meet you. Now when you read that at face value, okay, big deal. Here's the big deal. Men don't carry water, pot, water pots. In Middle Eastern customs, that wasn't a man's job. Women go to the well. So it was something supernatural. It was something for them to see that only Jesus knew. It was something supernatural for them to comprehend that that was out of the ordinary. Does that make sense? Most people don't know that in customs and manners. Okay, but I wanted to throw that in there for free, okay? Follow him into the house that he enters. So you can imagine disciples going, what's he talking about? Some dude. A dude carrying a water pot? What, what, are we in the right place? And then I'm going to follow this guy? Lord, are you sure, right? Sometimes a word of wisdom will be way out of the wisdom of man. Because that don't make sense, does it? If you had their mindset, no, it doesn't make sense. It's like, that doesn't happen, but it did. All right, next verse. And say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? How does he know all this? Did Jesus set all this up? Did he pre-talk to the guy? No. He told him to go to a city. Did he text? Did he call? Did he, did he email? No. Supernatural wisdom. Supernatural insight. He saw the divine will of God. He had to have a Passover meal. He had to have a place to have Passover. So the Lord supernaturally downloaded, showed him what was going to happen. He conveys it to the people, to his disciples. They got to think at some point he's nuts. No, you can be as spiritual as you want. Oh, I don't believe Jesus. There was no Bible to believe. There was no nothing to back. Your only education you had was your Pharisees and Sadducees yiping in your ear that, that this guy's false. Maybe a few pieces of, of, of scroll that, that let you know a Messiah was coming, but, but he wasn't supposed to come this way, right? No, he was supposed to come as this, you know, conquering king, according to their teaching. All right, next verse. So this is trippy, isn't it? And then he will show you a large upstairs room. How'd you know he had a room upstairs? Furnished with carpets and dining couches prepared. The, he probably could have told you the decor in color. I, I, I've never really re detailed read this like I'm reading it now and teaching it. I mean, think about the supernatural detail. You know, Mark's going to be on the second chair on the back row with a hat on. He's going to be waiting. On, I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. He's never been there, according to any scripture we've seen. So it has to be supernatural, right? And then he's going to prepare the, we're going to prepare the meal there. Well, who's going to get the food? Next verse. Because I think I'm taking you down to, so you know, Judah or Joshua. Ah, I was actually supposed to stop at 12, but... Okay, we'll stop right. And then they left and found it just as it had been told them, and they prepared the Passover. <laughs> the brains were probably smoking. They were probably on fire. Wouldn't you be? I mean, if I told you, no, you see, you, even if I, told you, no, it, it's impossible. You would, you would think I text. You think I knew somebody in Tokoa or, or some city, and I set it all up because today's technology is, a, you know, yeah, I use something. Somehow I did this, right? These guys had nothing, nothing to go by, and Jesus did that. 
So what is that? Again, supernatural wisdom. It is the gift of the word of wisdom. He had a word for them. This is what I want you to do. And what was so powerful is it's in such detail. Now, this, this shows you not only the operation of the Holy Spirit ministering through an individual, which would be the Lord Jesus, but also shows you he was a prophet. Because most people who prophesy, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, so all this will be re, re-brought out, but a person who prophesies is not a prophet. They can hear a word from the Lord and speak it and prophesy it and declare it, but that doesn't make them a prophet. Because most people, when they prophesy, they prophesy in generality. I can prophesy to you and say, Yea, the Lord is going to bless you and take care of you and shine his love upon you, and da da da. And it's a prophecy. It's a true prophecy that God's going to bless you. Okay? I could take scripture and prophesy scripture over you. But if I start saying that you live at 123 Bubblegum Avenue, you know what I mean? And, you know, you have six couches. And, and I'm, I'm in detail. Like, like for an example, William Branham. Let's, we're going to go into all these guys later. But William Branham, though his ending was, was bad, his ministry and his beginning was awesome. This prophet, that when he, when he was up before people, he never prophesied. He never ministered until the angel of the Lord showed up. I can show you films. I have films. And he would be as humble as an old Kentucky farmer. And he wouldn't know, he wouldn't know what to say. He'd mumble. And, well, I'm just glad you're all here tonight. And the Lord's good. And he'd just, just mess about a little bit. And all of a sudden, he'd say, well, I'm waiting on the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is here. And all of a sudden, the anointing would come on him. He would change. And the, and, and the power of God would hit him. And then he would call people out. And they would come up. And he'd say, well, on July 4th at 745 on Elm Avenue and Blue Street, you were involved in an accident. Yeah, oh, my God. You were in a Buick sedan, whatever. He would nail it all the way down, even to their age. And this wasn't no fake stuff. They didn't have no camp, you know, microphones. on. This was real deal, Holy Ghost. He was a prophet. Isn't that powerful? We don't have guys like that much anymore. But it's available. It's the same Holy Ghost. It's the same Holy Spirit that moved through Jesus. And it's the same Holy Spirit that will move through you. You just have to ask. And if he wants to, he will. If he doesn't do it that way, it's okay. It's not yours. It's his gifts. Does that make sense? And that takes, that takes the showmanship out of it. It takes all the burden off of you. And it just says, Lord, I'm here. Whatever you want to do. Whatever your gifts are, use me. Is that is that okay? How many of you like those teachings about those 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 great warriors? I'll go into more. Okay, John chapter two. Let's go to John John two, twenty two through twenty four. Yeah, I love them old stories, and like I said, I'll repeat some of them, and I'll mix some together and tell you more and more. I did tell you about Howard Carter last. Uh, service uh, but it was a I said the 19th century I, I misspoke it was a 20th century by the way uh, Howard Carter was uh, ministering with lesser Summerall. okay you'll be ready oh yeah I had uh, Luke no John 2 22 through 24 huh no, that's okay. I don't ever pre-give my scriptures to him because sometimes I don't know if I'm going to go there. And it's just, I, I don't like doing that anyway. So, so when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed and trusted in him and relied on the scripture that the words Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, identifying themselves with him after seeing his signs, attesting his miracles that he was doing. But Jesus, for his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and understood the superfluity and fickleness of human nature. Doesn't he know that? Go now to um, go to uh, chapter four, sixteen through nineteen. Did I give you twenty? Did I finish on twenty-four? Yeah. Okay. 
So they believed on what he had done, okay? They believed the miracles. And this, Jesus said, go call your husband and come back. Remember this? What story is this? The woman at the well, right? And the woman answered, I don't have a husband. <laughs> Liar. Go back. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said I don't have a husband. Now watch, this is the word of wisdom working. Okay? This is the word. It's actually, watch this, it's the word of wisdom with discernment working together. You might want to write that down. Discernment, it, it, it helps balance or helps activate or it's, it's, it's part of the whole process of the word of wisdom, okay? Discernment. you got to discern too. All right? Oh, this girl's in trouble. For you have had five husbands. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Five husbands and the man you're now living with. Look, he didn't even say, he got her past and her present. And the man you're now living with is not your husband. You said this truly. That's a word of wisdom, isn't it? You say, you know what? You could use this in evangelism. You can use this ministry to somebody. I've used it in ministry before where somebody was lying to me. I knew by the Holy Ghost, praying for somebody, if it was an addiction, and he told me what it was, and they wiggled their way and said, no, no, I don't do that, I don't do that. I was like, yes, you do. And then they finally confessed, yes, yes. yes uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. What, 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 I, didn't, I wasn't accusing them. It wasn't the spirit of, now watch this. You've got to be careful. It wasn't the spirit of guessing or the spirit of criticism. Man, I'm going to get ahead of myself. But in some of these prophetic schools, which you, you, you need to stay away from, some of these prophetic schools, they'll teach you how to prophesy based on people's emotion, based on their body language. So if you're starting out and they, they, they see you crying, then they feel like they've hit a nerve, and then they keep with that particular th theme or what have you. It, 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 I tell you, it's trickery. It's trickery. When you are operating in these gifts, I don't care if you're falling on the ground flopping like a fish. Here's the word of the Lord. This is the sin you're in. This is what's happening, and there is no doubt about it. Okay? Now, you've got to be bold to do that. But you learn the gifts. The gifts, you just, it's, it's a process, and we'll go over that later as we go down the line. Isn't that powerful, though? Five husbands, and the dude you're shacking up with, that ain't your husband. Next verse. The woman said, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Duh. That's the biggest duh scripture I think I've ever seen. <laughs> Do you think? I think. I think if you were a prophet. <laughs> wow. Okay, so let's go to another scripture. Is this good? Let's see if we can get a couple more in before you go. Acts 26, 16. See, sometimes these scriptures are right where I want to be, and then I want to go above and be, you know. So just be patient with me if I jump over it or I'm ahead of it or whatever. I, I like to get the whole context together. All right, waiting on Joshua to wake up. Huh? Acts, tw Acts 26, 16. All together, ready, everybody. Acts 26, 16. Got it. <laughs> oh, all right, here we go. Yeah, I guess we can do it. Get up. Not you all. Get up. Stand. I've been waiting for him to say that. Stand on your feet. I've appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you to serve as a minister and as a witness to testify with authority not only to the things which you have seen but also to the things which I will appear to you. Next. choosing you for myself and rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their spiritual eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness and release of their sins to the inheritance among those who have been sanctified, set apart, made holy by faith in me. So he is getting a prophecy. He's getting a word of wisdom. This is what you're going to be doing. Next verse. So King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So that was Paul talking about when he was 
knocked off his beast. He was blinded and those things. What happened? He had a supernatural revelation. He had a word of wisdom that he is going to be called into ministry. He was going to be called into his future. He did not know that on his own. It was impossible, right? He couldn't see it, first of all, physically because he's blind. Now, how do you see the future anyways? Okay, so that's another example. All right, let's go to Acts 27. Acts 27, verse 21. Sometimes my English is not too good. And they had gone a long time without food because of sick, seasickness and stress. And Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have followed my advice and should not have set sail for Crete and brought on this damage and loss. Okay? He had warned them, didn't he? And even now I urge you to keep up your courage. So really he's, he's had a word of wisdom twice. And be in good spirits because there will be no loss of life among you but only the loss of the ship. Now if you read this in context, they were in a hurricane. If you read this in context, they were in a very, look, it wasn't a t Titanic. It wasn't steel bolts and, you know, uh, metal sidings. This was wood. Okay, I would just call it a rickety boat. You got all this food. You got all this tackle. You have all these, these, you know, guards and all these prisoners. It's not a good day. They were, they were going to lose their lives. And for, for him to say this had to be supernatural because it looked, it'd be like going to crash in an airplane. And the guy stand up and say, we're not going to crash. Dude, the wing just fell off. Don't worry about it. We're all going to make it. You know, that, that was an incredible thing. But he did this by the Holy Ghost. Because, again, if you read it in context and read parts of the, the Greek, they were, getting, they were getting whacked. Next verse. I don't know if you've ever been on a boat during a storm. It's not fun. For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I, I serve stood before me. Stop being afraid, you big baby. No, he didn't say that part, but he said, Stop being afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Now, notice this. You must stand before Caesar, the prophesied future, the word of wisdom that God had told him. You're going to do this. You're going to stand before kings. You're going to do this. Right? That was a word already in motion. So the event taking place cannot destroy the word in motion. The, the, this is what you have to understand. When you get a word from God, you have a prophetic future. So everything is happening to you till then can't stop it. You can forfeit it. You can destroy it, but man can't. Man can kind of delay you. You can have issues, but it cannot stop the prophesied destiny of God. That's why it's healthy to get a word from God and say, God, what's my future? Where do you see me? And then you push towards that. And no matter what happens in your life, you get knocked down, you have a problem, whatever. You say, no, I'm not going to stay here. This is not where I die. This is not where I lie. My destiny is over there. And you see that? And Paul pushed and he believed it. But then God helped him out because this was terrible. He said, don't be afraid. So Paul was afraid. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? <laughs> when, we, when we're living our lives and we... God promises us great things, and all of a sudden we get hit with something. You know, don't we sometimes go, God, where are you? Where's your promises? You said I was going to do this, but, you know, it's like Joseph. You promised me the palace, but I'm in the pit. You promised me the palace, but I'm in Potiphar's house. You promised me the palace, but I'm in the prison. Right? But then one day he got into the palace, and he never left, did he? They took his bones out of Egypt. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, man, God has given you the lives of all those who are sailing with you. You know how that is? God said, look, I'm giving you those lives. Why? Because I prophesied through you that you're going to do it. You're, this, I gave you a word of wisdom. I'm going to prove myself through you to these men under this terrible situation. They're going to make it. God has a lot of, at stake here with his reputation. He always does for all of us. Next verse. Yeah, it's almost 8 o'clock. So keep your courage, men. 
I could just see him saluting. <laughs> For I believe God and have complete confidence in him that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. Wow. Next verse. But we must run the ship aground on some island. Wow. So he's basically saying we're going to have to crash this thing. But don't worry about it. We're going to crash it, but we're going to make it. That took a lot of faith in Paul, didn't it? But it was the word of the Lord from Paul. Now go to 1 Corinthians 5, and I'll finish up the word of wisdom, at least for tonight's teaching. Again, I'm going to come back around. We're going to bring the wagons and circle it again and again. You're going to hear it all over the place, okay? So, again, it's not one and done. So go to 1 Corinthians, what did I tell you, 5? Is that what I said? Please, just real quick. And Acts report everywhere that there is sexual immorality among you, a kind of immorality that is condemned even among the unbelieving Gentiles, that someone has an intimate relationship with his father's wife. That's not good. Next verse. And you are proud and arrogant. You should have mourned in shame that the man who had done this disgraceful thing would be removed from your fellowship. So what is Paul? Paul has a word of wisdom. He knows something's going on in the church. Next. For though, for I, though absent from you in the body, but present in spirit, have already passed judgment on who has committed this act as if I were present. He said, I'm already there by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is, remember, Paul was an apostle. So when a, an apostle is over a church, he's got, I don't want to use this word, so it's not a new age word. He has the vibe or the feeling. He has the pulse. He has the understanding of the Holy Spirit. He knows what's going on for the most part. Sometimes he has detail. Sometimes he does not. If you're an overseer of a church or church is, for the most part, God will give that supernatural download so there's an understanding, not for control, but for, for correction, for help, right? If you've got a bleeding sheep, you've got problems with sheep, you have a you know a wounded sheep or you have a, a, a wolf among the sheep, you got to know these things, right? So Paul was, was in tune to the Holy Ghost. All right, just a couple more verses and we're gone. In the name of our Lord Jesus, whom you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit. See that again? That's not freaky. He's not sitting there hovering. Was that Paul? Paul just walked in. That's so weird. No. In spirit, meaning the Holy Ghost is there. I'm there in the supernatural connection with you. Remember, remember the prophet and his, uh, and his uh, it was Elijah, and his, his, his little dude went out there and, and stole the money and did all that stuff. Remember, the, what did he say? Did not my spirit go with you? Well, the Holy Spirit went with them, came back, and, and told Elijah, Hey, dude, this guy's a thief. <laughs> right? With the power of the Lord Jesus, here we go. We'll stop. You are to hand over this man to Satan. This is a whole other teaching. I don't have time for it. You don't think this is church discipline? It is. New Testament church discipline. This is heavy, and you don't hear it taught much, and we're not going to go into it. But hand over this man to Satan for the destruction of his body so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That is heavy. But let me tell you something. That has to be done in love, spiritual authority, and maturity, or it becomes witchcraft. And we're not going to get into that. So uh, that's not something that is to done, be done lightly. And you notice, you notice, well, she took it away, but you'll notice that it was the apostles. To, Don't take my scriptures from me. <laughs> uh, leave them. Uh, that, it, that took that apostle's authority to do that. It's, it's heavy duty. But it is church discipline. Would God do that? Yeah. He sure would. He loves. And he don't want a person to go to hell. So if he, ta he, if he has to use affliction to put you on your back to look up, he'll do it. He sure will. All right. How's that, is that pretty good to help you out a little bit tonight? I hope it does. We're going to get more into it. Like I said, get, we're going to camp out. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of good teaching as the Holy Spirit helps us. Father, thank you. I pray now as we leave that you would just anoint all of us, Lord, to walk in these supernatural gifts, just to be open and to ask, 
Lord, what do you want us to do? Be free, Holy Spirit, to use us, whether it's uh, you know in a service, Lord, or whether it's uh, in our families or just at the marketplace. I thank you that we're all anointed. I thank you that the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells on all of us tonight. We love you and thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, don't forget all the prayer requests, and I will see you Sunday. Be blessed.